Whatever hell is, it is not discipline. Right. It's punishment. Right. It's the natural consequence. So, so God does discipline. The question is, is God the source of punishment? I've actually known pastors who've preached that God is the great police officer in the sky. <gasps> no. Yes, watching for you to mess up and writing you tickets and putting in your book. And if no. you don't get the blood of Jesus to pay your fine, then he'll have to punish you. Most Christians I know are more afraid of God who's trying to save them than the sin in their own life that's killing them. Welcome to Design for More, sponsored by Come and Reason Ministries and Honey Lake Clinic. I'm Dr. Tim Jennings, and I'm joined today by Danielle Rome, one of our therapists, and our chief of chaplains here, our, our senior chaplain, uh, Dr. James Johnson. Uh, and our topic today, we're going to be discussing friendship with God. And I know this is something that's been on your heart, Danielle, that you want mm-hmm. to discuss. So share with us the, the, uh, the, you know, the idea where we're going to go with this question about friendship with God. Yeah, absolutely. So... The main reason that I wanted to talk about this is the whole topic of this podcast is that we're designed for more than how we're currently living. And I believe that the main thing that God created humanity for is for friendship with him. And so I hear a lot of people talking about trying to find their purpose, trying to find what they want in life. But what we were ultimately first and primarily created for is that friendship. And so I think it's very important for us to talk about. No, I, I, I agree with you completely. Mm-hmm. And so as, as you brought that up, our original intention, God designed huma- human beings to be friends with him. And would you say that most human beings are friends with him? Unfortunately not. So, no, yeah. it's obvious, a rhetorical question. It's obviously <clears throat> true. The question that we want to ask is why? Why? What, what's interfered with... Uh, if, God, if God is the creator, uh, he created us in his image... Mm-hmm created us for friendship, something's gone wrong, something's interfering with our friendship with him. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if we can identify that, maybe we can identify God's solution that helps restore friendship. Mm-hmm. So what do you think gets in the way? And, and maybe we can move away from friendship with God to just friendship. Are there certain mm-hmm. principles that we as human beings understand are required for genuine friendship? Right. And then do, can we identify in our own human friendships and relationships things that necessarily and always break down friendship? Yes, yeah. So what, what kinds of things as a therapist, as a human being, have you experienced that are, are critical, essential, foundational? No, no, it's nice to have, but mm-hmm. it's required. You can't have friendship without it. Have you identified anything? The first thing that comes to mind is trust and on the flip side of that, fear. So fear being something that gets in the way of friendship and relationship. So what you said, trust and fear, okay, mm-hmm. okay, and and that's in our human relationships. Would you agree, Pastor? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, one of the things that when we think about fear is it's always the fear of, of maybe doing the wrong thing, saying the wrong thing, or or doing something to break the relationship so you lose it. And a lot of times when we see that that lack of trust, like you said, of the of the familiarity of the I trust you to accept me in my authenticity and and forgive me my failures that fear definitely drives a wedge so so fear trust in human relationships Mm -hmm. more trust closer intimacy yes okay more fear more guardedness Mm -hmm. more suspiciousness yes is this fair to say absolutely so can that translate those two qualities trust greater trust more intimacy greater fear, more distance, can that translate straight into a relationship with God? Absolutely. That the more trust, and without trust, there's no friendship? Absolutely. More fear? Okay. Boy, there's several directions to go here on this mm-hmm. conversation. We probably need to go both. So I'm going to throw out the two directions that maybe you need to draw me back to, to unpack these. One yeah. is, what are the elements in actual real-life living relationships that are required for trust to exist? Yep. What are the what are the what are the things that cause fear to rise? So which way do you? I mean, you, you, you wanted to talk about this, so I, you've identified critical issues: fear and trust. Right. We need to unpack because people want a, a better friendship with God, that, or maybe even with other humans. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and we see this all the time in our patients. Yep. But do they ever actually trust and get burned? Yes. Okay. So. Yep. 
This is the question, right? What is required? Let's go there first then. What is required <laughs> in order for trust to actually operate as God designed? Can you think about that with your patience? You've said you, you shook your head, say, trust, but they get burned. Well, then trust isn't operating as God designed, is it? Mm -hmm. Why not? not. And, and, and pipe in any yeah, time. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that we, we've mentioned before is, is faithfulness, right? That when you, Can I rephrase that word? Yes. Okay, because you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. But can we use the word trustworthiness? Yeah, I was going to synonym that. Yeah, you're already there. That it's this when we give somebody the opportunity to be trustworthy, and and trust always takes time. And one of the things you know that I have been frustrated with the way church operates, at least in my experience, is like I grew up singing this song in church: "All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give," and we expect people when they begin to come into a relationship with God to surrender all. And sure, God's trustworthy enough to believe that, but how crazy would it be if the first time I met somebody, I trusted them completely, like, here's a key to my house, and here's one of my debit cards, and here's my social security number. Trust takes time, mm -hmm. but trust also takes opportunities to let somebody be trustworthy. Okay, so so it's interesting how you phrase that. It's very interesting, because you use the word, let somebody be trustworthy. Mm -hmm. Okay, rather than let somebody demonstrate whether they are trustworthy, and that's or not. what I meant by that. Yeah, I, I know, but it's a it's an it's, important it's, distinction. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, I understand that, and I want to clarify that because um, because God is trustworthy. Mm -hmm. So in relation with Him, it, the the opportunity will, and this is why the Bible actually I think says life eternal. That doesn't say life eternal is that they will trust you. Jesus said in John seventeen, life eternal is that they know you. And when you get to know a trustworthy person, mm -hmm. actually know, not know about, but know, you don't actually have to try to trust them. Mm -hmm. When you actually get to know a genuinely trustworthy person who loves you more than themselves, sacrificed to protect you, put all on the line for your sake, you don't have to try to trust them. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? That's right. So that's why, uh, So, but the issue here is, yes, um, genuine friendship requires trust, but healthy trust requires trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So what what makes somebody trustworthy? And there's at least three elements of trustworthiness, and most people miss two of them, at least two of them. There's three elements of to, to truly trust somebody. They have to have at least three qualities. The first thing that comes to mind is consistency. Okay. Reliability, predictability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so if they're they're reliably and predictably abusive, can you trust them? Love is the second one. <laughs> okay, love is. I would suggest love is the first one. Okay. <laughs> if, if they don't love you more than themselves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. when when times get tough, they'll betray you to protect themselves. Wow. Yeah. Is that not right? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. God so loved the world that He gave. That's right. And in Christ's life, greater love is no man that He give His life for a friend. This is how we know what love is: that Christ gave His life for us. And so, you know, in the life of Jesus Christ, we have seen God, the fullness of the Godhead, dwelt in Him bodily. Mm -hmm. If you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. So part of His mission was to reveal that, in fact, God does love us with an infinite love that has no limits, and He, he loves us so much He'll let us harm Him mm -hmm. rather than stop us from doing it. Yeah. Okay. So. We, we get that with God. Yes. Okay. But in our human relationships as well, it, it would be foolish to trust somebody who doesn't actually love you, mm -hmm. at least yeah. on the type of intimacy. And we're talking here, we're not talking about just trusting a mechanic to fix your car. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Right. And I think that's something that we need to be careful of is applying what we know about human relationship to God. Because, yes, we can apply some elements of that, but people are not perfect. People fall short. Sometimes they are selfish, right? People change, but God doesn't change. Well, okay, so it's a nuance. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between imperfection and motive of heart. Yeah. I had a, a person in one of my Bible study classes many years ago uh, that taught me a very important lesson. He said, my wife's not perfect, and everybody laughed, but he said, but I know she wants to be. I know she loves me so much. She never wants to fall short. She never wants to let me down. And then he went on to say, and I'm not perfect, but I want to be for my wife. I never want to let her down, and I never want to fall short. And because I know she loves me that much, and she knows I love her that much, mm -hmm. that when our human shortcomings come up and we do let each other down, we both know there's no intent in the heart to harm that we're still on each other's side mm -hmm. and we still have each other's back. 
and therefore there's the, the, that is managed so much more differently because we both know we're for the other. And so trust is never broken in those shortcomings. Yeah, yeah. So this is the difference uh, versus the person who's selfish rather than selfless but flawed and foibled. There's a difference, and it has to go to that motive. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's absolutely. a great distinction. Absolutely. Okay, versus, and that's where in true trust, you can trust somebody to have your back and to be for you mm -hmm. and still recognize that they may have limited abilities. Right. They may not be able to, uh, if you're in dire need, pick you up and carry you two miles to an aid station because they're 80 years old. Mm -hmm. But they would if they could. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, and so th there's that distinction. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so but but trustworthiness, mm -hmm. uh, love you more than self. Mm -hmm. They also have to have some level of, and this is where you go to the question what you said of reliability. Mm -hmm. I call it maturity. Yeah. So you may have a child, five year old, loves you more than anything. Saw you in danger in the street, they would run out there to try to protect you, put themselves in harm's way. They they're not it. Follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Would you trust them to take your paycheck to the bank? <laughs> because they want to steal it, because they're against you, or because they have such immaturity that they aren't reliable or predictable. They'll make, they'll, they will be easily taken advantage of. They can be duped, they can get distracted. They, and so you can't trust them to carry out duties in life. Yeah. Now, this, is, this level many people miss. They will get in relationship with someone who mm. they loves them and has nothing, no desire to hurt them, but they're not mature. And they constantly do immature things. They don't shoulder the responsibilities of the role in which they're applying for, spouse, for instance. Mm -hmm. And they continually let the other down and you can't really rely on them or trust them. Yeah. That and then the sense. third is the third level is they have to have some level of wisdom. So I, I and what wisdom means understanding how God designed things to run and what health actually is. Right. So a person, a husband, I, I know certain Christian men who really love their wives and have good self-control, mature, but they're not wise in how God designed relationships and they actually believe that men are to have authoritarian control over their spouses and they use authoritarian dictatorial methods with good motive because they themselves don't understand and they think God runs his universe like a Caesar runs Rome and they become very punitive towards their wives. And this, it, they can't, and they ultimately destroy love and cause problems in the marriage because, and so you, they can't really be trusted. Not because they're intending to do harm; they're really, really working so hard. Yeah. Like Saul of Tarsus before the Damascus Road. Yeah. So makes sense. So back to our friendship with God. Mm -hmm. The same qualities. Does he does he love us more than himself? Is he mature, reliable, predictable? Well, the Bible's very clear. He changes not. He's a constant. Mm -hmm. He's always on our side. Yeah. And is he wise? <laughs> yeah. Okay. When you when you and, and and that's the point of the scriptures. Yeah. It shows us his constancy, his reliability, his love, and his wisdom. And then, so that's conceptual. And then you have to actually know him. You have to engage. So that's the one side. Yeah. And then that and so once he has all those qualities. Well, if that's the way he is, and it goes to the other side, the fear question. Yes. Imagine you had, uh, maybe you have a brother who is just a really mature, Christ-like, good guy, really good guy, and and he's single, and he's an adult, and you have a uh, have a friend you'd like him to to you know to introduce him to, but your friend has been told a bunch of things about your brother that's untrue. Yeah. And she has in her mind that he's an abuser, he's uh, violent, he's uh, uh, uncaring, he's narcissistic. No, it's, none of that's true. Right. But if she has all that in her mind, would that allow her to actually even have a desire to get to know him? Absolutely not. Yeah. So, so... How does that apply to what's going on in Christianity and friendship with God? Is there any application there? Yeah, and that's actually, I'm glad you brought that up because that's a direction I think it'd be worth going into is what are some specific lies that people are believing about God that keeps them from even being interested in friendship? 
So, so can you think of some? Or Pastor James. Yeah. And, and, one of the ones that, yeah. that springs to mind, I was, I was kind of you know, going in the direction while y'all were talking of Job, that in Job's situation where he has all these terrible things happen to him, you know, his friends keep asking him, what yeah. did you do wrong? Where yeah. did you sin? You need to repent because God is inflicting this on you because you've done something wrong. And we come to believe that if, I, if I'm receiving something bad in my life, it's because God's punishing me. Mm -hmm. And we get a really interesting passage in Job 42 after all is said and done, Job says, before I'd only heard about you, but now I've seen you, and so I repent. And when he experienced God, he changed the way he interacted and thought about God as well. Yeah. Well, the report came back, if you remember, when, when some aspect of his estate was damaged. The mm -hmm. report to him was the fire of God fell, mm -hmm. but we'd already been revealed that it was not the fire of God, it was mm -hmm. the fire of Satan yep. that fell. And so the report often, God is doing this when God is not the one doing it. In, in mm -hmm. fact, you know, Satan is the father of lies, lies yep. and lies believed about someone break the circle of love and trust. Yes. If you believe the lie that your spouse is cheating, but they're not cheating, but you believe they are, then you don't trust them. You believe they're a cheat. Mm -hmm. in, in objective reality, they're still faithful and loyal, but because you believe they're a cheat, you now are fearful and you now become self-protective. And this is what lies do. Yeah. And so, so the, the question of friendship with God, what, what would, you, would, would you argue with the idea that the number one thing that keeps people having friendship with God today are lies about God? I would agree with that, yeah. And so 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, for though we live in the world, we don't wage wars. The world does. The weapons we use are not worldly. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. And what we do is we demolish every argument and pretension. That's things that pretend. Mm -hmm. uh, every tension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought. And so the Bible actually takes the position that the war is over the truth about who God is. And lies believed break love and trust. And this is the key thing yeah. for friendship, love and trust. But lies believed break that and cause us to have a different relationship with God than friendship. And what would the different relationship be for those who still believe in God but actually don't trust him look like? Believe in God, don't trust him. So one aspect is, well, we just throw off the belief in God. There's no God. Mm -hmm. But there are many people who believe in God but aren't friends with him. What might that look like? Well, the first two things that come to mind, and I already brought up fear, is a big part of it. So being afraid of him, being afraid that if you make a mistake, he might punish you, and nobody wants to be friends with somebody like that. Right, that's right. The other one is that I'm thinking of is anger and resentment. So maybe somebody had an experience that they blame God for, and, and so, so again, what does that relationship, is a biblical example mm -hmm. of the type of relationship that people have with God yeah. when they're not friends with him? The Pharisees, you know, okay. the religious leaders, that they, mm -hmm. they you know, were doing all the right things, but Jesus even actually said, you, you have the keys to the kingdom, you don't go in yourself, and you keep other people from And how would again. you describe their, their, their religion? Oh, it was legalistic. So it's a rules-oriented. Right. Yeah. And... Jesus said in John 15, 15 to his disciples, I no longer call you servants. The actual Greek means slaves. Wow. Rather, I call you friends because a slave or a servant doesn't understand their master's business. Now, contrast a relationship. Does a servant slash slave have a relationship with the master? Is there a relationship there? It's a type of relationship. Yes, there is a relationship. Yeah. Okay, that, that, yeah. there was absolutely a relationship. Describe the quality, how that relationship functions. You have to act a certain way or you might get in trouble. So what's the underlying motive then for the servant? Fear. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is, this is what mm -hmm. I'm pointing out. The yes. Bible does describe a relationship with God that is fear-based, not mm -hmm. friendship-based. Mm -hmm. And the fear-based relationship is the servant relationship. I'm going to obey so I don't get in legal trouble, or I don't get punished, or the master's not mad at me, or I get praise, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Mm -hmm. I get an attaboy. Yep. I don't have to understand why. All I have to do is do or die. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. 
I just obey because it's the rule. It's written on stone, and that's why we do it. Okay? So is any of this friendship with God? No. So, so, how do we, so how do we help people? What is, can, you, can you conceive of an underlying premise, belief? And I think there is one, one idea, one little seed buried deep in Christianity, one concept, one falsehood, one lie, one deep in Christianity that actually actively works to keep religious people from being friends and maintaining a slave-servant relationship. One idea, one lie, one falsehood. You know, you know what I'm thinking, Pastor. You want yeah, to say yeah. it? It's that God's government functions like human government, that we have to do things for God the same way we do for people. God's government, when the government is based on law. Yep. So God's law, exactly. And so my, you, you guys have heard me say this, God is the creator. He speaks things into existence. His laws are the laws of reality are built on, laws of health, laws of physics, the laws that govern the operation of our minds and relationships. One of those being, it you cannot have friendship without trust. You can't. That isn't a rule that says, I've made up a rule. It's how things work, how, how reality functions. And, and trust requires trustworthiness. And trustworthiness requires Integrity, honesty, love, loyalty, truthfulness. And that's not a list of rules. Yeah. And this is why the Bible says man looks on the outward appearance, the Lord looks on the heart. And to restore us to friendship, we have to have something happen in our heart. So can you think of doctrines taught in Christianity that actually incite fear and undermine trust? A few. <laughs> okay, say so let's 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 think let's let's look at those and see what law they're based on. Are they based these doctrines predicated on the idea that there that God is required because his law works like human law, and human law requires judicial oversight and infliction of punishment. That's what it requires. Whereas design law is like the laws of health. If you break it, you get sick, and and the person in charge, if they love you, heals the damage. They put you mm -hmm. in harmony with the law again. They put mm -hmm. the law back in your heart and mind, as the New Covenant says. So yeah. can you think of doctrines taught in Christianity that actually teach a human concept of law and actually promote fear under the guise of, under the claim that God is love? Yeah. So the first one that comes to mind is, you know, fire and brimstone. You don't want to go to hell. You'd rather go to heaven. So do goods so that you go to heaven. If you do bad, you'll go to hell. Okay. Yeah, the, the sinners in the hands yeah. of an angry God kind of concept that you're you know dangling over the the spider has got you in his web, and if you don't do the right thing, then you're going to be cast into mm -hmm. the like you know that that eternal punishment. So the idea then is that hell is a place created by God for the punishment of wicked. Correct. Mm -hmm. So God throws people there. God is doing this to them, mm -hmm. rather than hell is the consequence people bring upon themselves by their own rebellion against God and his laws for life. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to do away with the idea that there's a weeping and gnashing of teeth, there's a terrible torment and suffering that the wicked experience, but there's two ways to view it. One, God's law works like human law, and therefore, for justice, he has to use power to inflict pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. The other would be like laws of health, a person who smokes heavily and drinks heavily and then gets both lung and liver disease, and at the end of their life, they have trouble breathing and they die of liver failure. There's a terrible suffering and pain that they go through, but it's not inflicted by the doctor or by God. It is because they broke the laws of health and, and ruined themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever had conversations with people who hold to the view that in order for God to be loving and just, he must torture people? Right. Yeah. How, how do you, what would you say to them? Well, it's one of those recognitions that you're, you're d describing one characteristic of God, of his character, of who he is, that's in, in, in like, like a conflict because it's, it's two opposites. You know, it's, it's like saying something's heavy and light at the same time, that, you know, if, if God is loving and compassionate and wants relationship, then how can he also be this vengeful, wrathful, I've got to, you know, actually torture you and, you know... But doesn't the Bible say God has wrath? 
Well, it's, it's the context within the relationship of saying that there are emotions that God feels in his personhood, but the way his character is, once we know him, is we realize that God has created boundaries not for the sake of, of punishing us because he wants to just inflict pain on us, but it's this idea of discipline. You know, I was reading this morning in my quiet time where you know, David is delighting in the discipline of God because it actually puts him back on the right okay, path. Okay, so, so let's not confuse two things now. Um, let's not conflate them. There is a dis- clear distinction between discipline, which comes from the mm-hmm. word disciple, which means mm-hmm. to teach. Right. God disciplines those he loves, and punishment, which comes from the word punitive, means to exact vengeance upon. The wages of sin is death. Mm-hmm. Whatever hell is, it is not discipline. Right. It's punishment. Right. It's the natural consequence. So, so God does discipline. The question is, is God the source of punishment no, for the we wicked? Are. And, and, and if you believe God's law, and I'm going to tell you, the answer mm-hmm. goes directly to what people believe about God's law. If yeah. you believe God's law works and functions like human law, it's just a system of made-up rules, then the answer has to be yes, because if he doesn't, everyone gets away with everything, yep. and there's no justice, so yes, he has to punish. But if you understand God's laws are the laws life is built upon, and to break away from them would be like tying a plastic bag over your head and, and, and breaking the law of respiration, God doesn't have to actually take action to kill you, God has to take action to save you. Get the plastic bag off your head, okay? And therefore his wrath then, in the end, this is what Paul says in Romans 8, 1, 18, 18 through 26, um, it, 28 actually, 18 through 28, is that God's wrath is letting people go. When, once he's done everything and you insist and insist and insist and insist on rebelling against him, the only thing that God would like to do is let you go. But when you when he lets go, you are separating yourself from the very source of life, and the only result is ruin and death. Mm-hmm. That's design law understanding, yeah. and that has been completely replaced in Christianity with this idea of an imperial dictator God who enforces rules with punishment because of the one lie. God's law functions like human law. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And then we teach lots of doctrines that are that are what's the word? Designed to protect us and hide us from God mm. because we don't trust him. Yeah. And what happens is there's this huge, huge body of theology that people place their trust in the ceremonies, mm-hmm. in the sacraments, in the rituals, in the blood. In the Eucharist, yep. and some in their works, most not in their works, most in the substitutionary works of Christ who did the work for us, mm-hmm. and then we claim his works in some legal mechanic in a courtroom in heaven, because we don't trust God. And, and we, we, we pray for the mediator to stand between us and God and hide us from him. Cover yeah. me so the Father can't see me. Mm-hmm. It's exactly the opposite of what David prayed yeah. after David sinned. He said, search me and see the wicked way in me, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew the right spirit within me. See, when you, when you understand God as the creator and sin deviates from his perfection, then you understand that sin is like sickness. And if you were sick and you went to the doctor, you wouldn't push your healthy brother in front of you and say, examine my healthy brother and all the good health you find in my brother, write it in my medical record. You wouldn't say that. That's what a lot of Christianity does. Mm-hmm. What you would say is, search me. MRIs, ultrasounds, look in the deep secret places of my being, find what's wrong and fix it. Mm -hmm. That's true Christianity. We need our Savior, but we can't do that if we don't trust him. And thus the penal legal models of Christianity actually teach us a theology that, that continues to promote distrust of God. And we trust the payment, we trust the blood, we trust the pleading, we don't trust him. Yep. And we see a lot of this in, in the Old Testament with the sacrificial system where, you know, that God, in the beginning we talked about Eden, that in Eden God walked with Adam and Eve and had, you know, had fellowship with them and had conversation and poured his truth directly into their lives by speaking to them and talking to them and having relationship. And when they broke that, of course, they had to leave God's sacred space because they were no longer fit for it. And we come to this belief, or at least the Israelites did, that... When God created the the tabernacle, it was a result of them not wanting to come into His presence at Mount Sinai. He tells they tell Moses, "We are too scared to go into God's presence." And Moses was saying on Exodus twenty, mm-hmm. "There's no need to be afraid." That's right. Mm-hmm. They and didn't need to be afraid, but they were. Yeah. Why? Because they misunderstood who God was. Mm-hmm. They had lies in their heart and mind. 
And so that's what the tabernacle and eventually the temple was meant to be a model of returning to Eden that, you know, you had the world, you had Eden, you had the garden, and you had the same thing with the tabernacle. You had the outer court, the holy place, and the most yeah. holy place, but the goal was to get the people into God's presence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, because, but the sacrificial system, instead of changing their hearts and minds and drawing them to relationship with God, actually made them fearful. I must do these things to appease God. Yeah. So friendship yeah. with God mm-hmm. requires yeah. love and trust. Yes. That means we have to actually know him, not know about him. Yes. And much of the things taught, and I think one core idea, God's law functions like human law, yep. then sets everything in the wrong setting where God is the one that we need to be protected from. Rather, And I will tell you, most, most, most Christians I know are more afraid of God who's trying to save them than the sin in their own life that's killing them. Yeah. It's true. Yep. I've seen that as well. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. and so when we understand, you know, God is creator and we start worshiping as the creator, then we understand he's he is the builder of reality and he creates everything in perfection and sin deviates or breaks away from that causing harm and thus it says in Galatians that those who sow to the carnal nature from that nature reap destruction Galatians 6 8 and God is the healer the restorer and he sent his son not to condemn the world but to save the world through him this is all through scripture but yeah. most of Christianity has this idea that he sent a son to do something to him yep. and that's a that keeps the fear going so if we think about friends of God in scripture there's at least I can think of two people that were actually named as God's friends Moses and David. Abraham. Oh. Abraham. Abraham. And Abraham. <laughs> yes. Uh, David is a man after God's own heart. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. But these were two were called friends. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is these were not sinless people. They both made mistakes. Mo- Moses was a murderer. Mm-hmm. Moses, you know, didn't want to go when God first called him at the burning bush. Well, I'm, a, I'm not a very good speaker and all this kind of stuff. And then Abraham, of course, Told, told little white lies a couple times to protect himself, if you remember, about his wife, Sarah, as being his sister rather than his wife, and and so forth. But yet, both of them were called friends of God. And I, I think there's a specific thing that they both did that made them his friends. Mm-hmm. And, and the specific thing was, if you remember, when God came and told Abraham, I'm going to wipe Sodom out. Abraham said, well, you said it, Lord. I believe it. That's all there is to it. If you said it, you must do it. Is that what Abraham did? Absolutely not. He began to argue in mm-hmm. a respectful way, but he actually began to argue with the Lord. He had a con- a friend says, and, and his and his issue was both love for the people and love for God. He actually said, "Surely the Lord of all the earth would do what is right. Don't do something that would hurt your reputation." A friend is concerned for how you're going to come across, what people are going to think about you. Yeah. And he was jealous for the reputation of the Lord. Yeah. And then Moses, at the same thing, when he says, I'm going to wipe these people out and start over with your family, Moses argued, no, you can't do it. You can't do it. All these people that have saw the great wonder of what you've done and bringing the whole world knows the story of how you brought them out of Egypt. What will they say if they die in the end that you have, or you're, not, that you're not powerful, you're not God? No, you can't do it. Your reputation would take a hit. Both of his friends argued with him. They didn't say, well, God said it, I believe that said it. Who am I to question? Right. Which is what much of Christianity teaches is is virtuous and righteous. No, the two friends actually argued, not in disrespectful and rebellious ways, but in love for their Lord, for his reputation. And then you mentioned Job. At the end of the book of Job, after all of his struggles, and his friends kept trying to say, you must be punished by God. And he kept saying, I know that's not right. And he, if you remember, he said early on, I don't know why this is happening. I can't figure it out. I have lots of questions. I want to have a conversation with God. But even if God were the one to kill me, yet I will trust him. Mm-hmm. He knew God would not treat him this way. Mm-hmm. And God wasn't treating him this way. And he had an issue. He was somewhat upset with God <laughs> because he didn't believe. He didn't believe God yeah. would do it, but he didn't know why. In the end, chapter 42, I believe 41, 42, God condemns the friends and says, Job, you have said of me what is right. Job was such a friend, he's not actually said you're a friend, but he was such a friend that in the council when Satan comes from walking to a fro of the earth and begins making accusations, God could call on Job and said, well, have you considered my, my servant? He calls him servant Job perfect and righteous all his ways. 
But Moses was also called a servant, and this is where I want to get this, merge these ideas now. The human idea of servant is what we said, fear-based, rules, avoid the lash. But in the scripture, you cannot give God the service he wants unless you're his friend. Mm -hmm. Because the service he wants is the service of knowing him where you can actually reveal him to others accurately like Job. And mm -hmm. when you're actually his friend, then you can become his true servant and serve him the way he wants. Yes. Which yes. is really interesting. We see that, you know, kind of put together when when you know John is writing his letters in First John, he's trying to encourage the people to to think well of God and to get rid of this. He says, you know, that we have no fear of condemnation if we experience his perfect love. And then he tells them, go on and say, this is how you should live your life in front of other people after that love is made perfect and that we don't have that fear of condemnation anymore. And I say, that's a huge point. Right. So, that, And that means we're, we're partakers of the divine nature. Mm -hmm. It's no longer I live, Christ lives in me. A any other comments you guys want to make about this? Absolutely. So I'm wondering for our listeners, a lot of people ask me, well, how do I start? Where do I start with building a relationship with God? Now that I understand truth, now that I want to get to know him, how do I begin? I'm wondering if either of you guys have anything to add to that. Well, what, I'd like to hear what you tell them before I, because I, I do a lot of talking, <laughs> so I'd love to hear your thoughts. What, what, what do you tell your patients? To just start. Start what, though? Talk to him. Okay. Just talk to him. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> I, 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 you're, I, yeah. I also tell them to turn your heart and mind's attention to reaching out and asking yep. for his presence to yep. know him. But is that all we do? Is there something else critically important if they're really going to get to know him. Pastor? Spend time with him. But, and, and, but, but, but does God given... Okay, if, if you had a, a boyfriend or a husband who you love with all your heart and he loves you and he's been sent away on the military service during World War I, no telephones, no cell phones, none of that, and he wrote you letters every day, mm -hmm. would you read them? Absolutely, yeah. So is there more than just in your mind's heart that we need to do? Are you referencing reading the Bible? That's one. That's only one of two, at least two other. One, yes. If, if they're not actually going to read God's Word, mm -hmm. they can pray all they want. They're not going to get to mm -hmm. know Him. Yeah. They're not. Yeah. Those letters, the Scripture is God's revelation of Himself to us. Yep. So they have to begin reading the stories and the stories are, and, and this is a very critical thing, as a friend versus a servant. A servant reads the Bible as a rule book, yeah. a code book of, of, sin, of deeds to be done and sins to be shunned. Okay, mm -hmm. Here's all the do's and the don'ts, things I got to do. This is a, a child, an infant, a, 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 a servant, a slave. What do I have to do? Okay, here are the rules. I obey the rules, yeah. and I can't get in legal trouble. Right. Yeah. A friend reads the Bible as God's... Uh, 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 God's revelation of himself to us in history, in time, mm -hmm. actions and deeds achieved and accomplished that a friend seeks to understand, why would God do that in that way? What's going on there? I know God is love, but in this particular, he thundered, he thundered, he threatened. How, how, how is that not like all the other dictators of the world? Yeah. And, and a friend will actually look into that and then, and then see all 66 together and say, oh my goodness, that's because they were heading into self-destruction and like a loving parent seeing a child running into the street will yell and if the child's rebellious, will even threaten to spank their bottom if they don't, if they don't stop before the car hits them. Yep. And they were running into all types of idolatry and, and self-destructive behaviors and God threatened because yeah. he loved them to get them to stop their self-destructive. But, but you have to have that, you have to read yes. the history and understand it. Yes. Okay, so the if they want to know God, they have to spend time. But mm -hmm. also in nature. Yep. Yeah, the natural God's, revelation. Yeah. Right. God's book of nature. To actually look to the creation and understand the lessons God has put in how reality works, the laws yes. of nature, and then integrating all that together. Yes. And then I would also say fellowship with people who know God. Yeah. And, I mean, even somebody you know yourself, like a boyfriend, a husband, when you hear stories 
from other people about that person. Hey, did you know that last week your husband did this, that, and the other? He came over and he and he helped us out when when our lawnmower broke and da da da. And yeah. you didn't know that. Does that actually help you even appreciate it more? Yeah, that's so true. Yep. So fellowship. Absolutely. And many people. Um, are tricked into thinking, well, it's just my own personal experience, isolated in my closet at home, Mm -hmm. praying without any connection to reality. That actually leads into forms of mysticism and and Mm self-deception. So Mm -hmm. if they really want to know God, yes, they need to pray. Anchored in reality. Yes. God's designs, how reality works, his revelations in history, as recorded in Scripture, and then hearing from people who have a journey with him and, and how he's helped in their lives. Yeah. And something else I want to add is this idea of walking with God and bringing into awareness that he's present at all times. I think sometimes people can separate out, this is an intentional time I'm spending with God, and then it's over. But I'm thinking about as you're living out purpose, as you're communing with other people, as you're doing things in alignment with... So he's always present. He's always present. But I agree also, with you. But being really aware of that. Is that an encouragement? That, if you understand God correctly, then it is. Yeah, see, yeah. see. Yeah, otherwise, see? we make him into a cosmic Santa Claus. You know, he sees you when you're sleeping. <laughs> he knows when you're awake. You, he knows if you've been bad or you still put it too nice of it. You still put it. Santa Claus, most people still have positive regard for. But you're right, is what or you're Santa saying. Santa Claus. I mean, yeah, yeah. You know. but, but, but it's more like a cosmic police officer. Yeah. Yeah. Watching with a radar gun to see when you mess up. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So it depends on which law model and whether they know them or not. If they actually know them, and can can I give you the metaphor? A metaphor or an object yeah. lesson? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I've I've known people. I've actually known pastors who've preached that God is the great police officer in the sky. <gasps> no. Yes, watching for you to mess up and writing you tickets and putting in your book. And if no. you don't get the blood of Jesus to pay your fine, then he'll have to punish you. Oh, no. No, yes, yes, okay? And so and so, if you, and I give this example to church audiences, imagine that you're driving along and you look in the rear view mirror and you see a police officer following you on the highway. And so you turn right and the police officer turns right. And you go down two blocks, turn left, and he follows you left. Are you feeling ever more relaxed and at <laughs> ease and feel secure and safe knowing law enforcement is keeping a good community? Or are you actually getting more stressed and anxious? Thinking about how much you're going to have to pay. The exactly. Yeah, you're getting more stressed you. and anxious. <laughs> God, as a law enforcement officer, does not bring peace. It incites mm-hmm. fear. Yes. And, and yet, but there's another way to understand it. If you understand Tour de France, the, the, the bicycle race, every one of those cyclists has a car following them everywhere. Mm. And what's the purpose of the car? If they get a flat, if, if they break down, if they get injured, that car is right there to pick them up, fix the, what's broken, and get them back on the road again. Mm-hmm. And so when you understand, yes, God follows us everywhere for the purpose of providing us everything we need to succeed in the journey of life. Yeah, but also seeing, and that ties into seeing God as a friend as well. That's right. Like if your best friend that loves you so deeply is doing everything you do with you, there's not loneliness in that. There's constant connection and support and love, and that's what... God's offering us. You're exactly right. And that I like what you said, but that requires us to have a... And this is what it means, I think Paul said, so we, mm-hmm. we are to, what's it, pray constantly? Or how, mm-hmm. how did he say? Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Yeah. And it's not be on your knees without ceasing. It is to have what you're saying, a yeah. heart attitude where we're in conversation with God yes. as with a friend as we go through the day. Yes. And we can just talk to him in our hearts and minds all day long. Mm-hmm and share the experiences with them. That's what that means. That's well said. For sure, because in, in some flavors of the faith, you know, you have to, you know, I remember being as a kid, hearing people say, I had to say my prayers before I went to bed. Like, it's not, oh, I get to talk to God. It's I have to say them to make God happy with me, to keep our, our relationship right, or he's going to zap me kind of thing. And when you actually experience that, it's, it's like getting, like you said, that letter from a loved one that you delight in. Yeah, and you so, want so, to talk yeah. to I mean, who, you know, what, yeah. what, you know when, when, as a parent, when my kids call me, I don't get frustrated. I get excited. I want to talk to them. And our Heavenly Father wants to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So God designed us for friendship. Mm -hmm. Yes. And He wants to be friends with everyone. And I will say, you know, what a friend we have in Jesus. The truth is, God is everyone's friend. The question is, will we recognize that and become His friend? Right. Mm -hmm. He is everyone's friend. Yeah. He is no one's enemy. But some people choose to be His enemy. That's right. Even on the cross... His enemies killed him. He was still their friend. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He was still for them and longing for their salvation. He was not against them. They were against him. Yeah. And when people realize that, it can actually re- lead them. It says the kindness of God leads us to repentance. 
And so I would just tell our listening audience, if, if you've had any questions about this, the truth is God is your friend. He's on your side. He's always for you, and He is for you. Who, who can be against you? He did not give us up, but gave us all things, okay? So have no doubt about that. God is your friend, and He wants you to be His friend. And I'll tell you, listen to what Danielle said. Spend time with Him every day in His Word, talking to Him, and uh, and and bringing in to your daily operations a connection with Him where you're talking to Him all through the day long. Hope you enjoyed this program. Uh, for If you have questions, send questions in to designformore.net, designformore.net, and we will bring some of those questions into future shows. If you'd like more resources, uh, visit comeandreason.com for free resources, and we hope to see you again next time. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Designed for More, brought to you by Come and Reason Ministries and Honey Lake Clinic. Also, don't forget to check out our other podcasts for more inspiring content.